Calling all cars. A presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 62. Wanted for highway robbery and murder. A man described as about 40 years old. Has gold teeth, sunken eyes. A harsh voice. This man is masquerading as an officer. Has a gun. That's all. Rose and Cliff. Calling all cars news at your Rio Grande service station. Get a copy free extra. extra. Rio Grande takes another step ahead. Within the next few weeks, Rio Grande will open 19 additional distribution plants in new territory. Tonight, a dinner is being held at Marysville, California attended by civic officials and independent gasoline merchants to welcome Rio Grande. Tomorrow, the motorists of Marysville enjoy for the first time the thrill of police car performance in their own cars. Congratulations, Marysville. Steadily, the sales of Rio Grande cracked gasoline have been growing. A 44% increase over last year. Rio Grande sales are growing, growing faster than any other gasoline in the West. There must be something unusual, even sensational, about a gasoline which enjoys such popularity when other companies are losing. The remarkable performance of Rio Grande is due to the costly cracking process, which releases energy that goes to waste in ordinary gasoline. Because Rio Grande crack gives extra speed and extra power, it has been officially specified wherever it has been sold for more police cars, fire engines. Yeah. And hundreds of thousands of motorists now get thrilling police car performance from their own car, even though they pay no more for Rio Grande cracked gasoline with Tetra Ethel. Tonight it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. There is a crime committed all too often for which the law provides nowhere sufficient punishment. I refer to the impersonation of an officer. Anything from petty extortion to murder can and sometimes does result from this one offense. The police force of your community spends much time and much money in a sincere effort to acquaint you with the police problems and the courage and intelligence with which they are solved. We go to great effort to build up your confidence in us and then some conscienceless scoundrel obtains a fake police badge and trades in on that confidence to gain his illegal ends. There should be an extreme penalty for this type of misrepresentation. In the case we are bringing you tonight, the criminal, with the aid of a phony deputy sheriff's badge, accomplished a score of robberies, inflicted indignities on innocent women and girls, and finally committed murder. Fortunately, his crimes were so numerous that he has been put out of the way forever. It is the constant aim of your police to make our streets and highways safe for you and your sons and daughters. If you ever have any reason to doubt the authenticity of a police officer who approaches you for any reason, remember that his badge is not his only identification. He also is required to carry a card indicating his name and rank. You have a right to demand to see this card. Your insistence on your rights will not only protect yourself, but also protect your policeman from the depredations of imposters seeking to impersonate him. It is a balmy evening in April 1923. 18-year-old Edgar Milburn and his companion, a girl of 15, after taking Edgar's parents home from church, drive on to the girl's home a few blocks away. In the spring, a young man's family. See, this is great. Being with you, I mean, and just sort of driving along. 
Oh, I wish we didn't have such a short way to go. Mm -hmm. So do I. I'd like to go somewhere and just sit and talk to you. And look at the moon? Mm -hmm. It's warm tonight, too. We could drive up on Mulholland Drive and park for a little while. But Mother might worry if I didn't get home early. Well, we'd only be a little late. It's only a couple of blocks out of the way. Come on, let's do it. Well, all right. But only for a little while. Promise? Promise. Here we are. Shall we stop here? All right. Gee, this is perfect. Look out there. You can see all the lights in Hollywood. And you can see the lights at the beach, too. Isn't it pretty, Edgar? Yeah. It makes me feel the same way as the organ in church tonight did. Sort of all warm inside. Me, too. See us, swell. Oh. <laughs> Look. There's someone walking along the road towards us. Yeah, I wonder what anyone would want to be walking around up here for. Probably some old tramp. Well, maybe we ought to turn on our lights. No, oh, he'll be gone in a minute. Edgar, he's coming right over towards us. Yeah, he is. I wonder what he wants. I I'm scared. Oh, silly. He's probably... Hey, what are you two doing here? Why, we're just talking. Get out of that car. Edgar, I don't... He's got a bag. Listen, mister, I don't know what you want, but we weren't doing anything wrong. Oh, no, no, Ed, get out of that car. Edgar, he's got a gun. Now, don't worry. He's a cop. He won't do anything. Just do as he says. Come on, you. Follow me. Yeah, but wait a minute. What's this all about, officer? I haven't done anything. That's all right. We'll only go over here a little ways. I want to ask you something. Oh, all right. You stay here, Marge. We'll be back in a minute. Don't go far, Edgar. I'm afraid. Oh, I'll be right back. Where are we going? Right over here with those trees. Well, I don't see why you're doing this. I was only parked up here talking to Marge. Yeah? Here we are. Now, take off your coat. Hey, wait a minute here. What's the big idea? Take off your coat and shut I up. will not. Get away from me. Marge! Uh, maybe you like that better. Just shut up and sit down on this tree and you won't be hurt. Well, what are you going to do? Just this, that's all. You can't tie me to this tree. I'll have you arrested. Shut up. Oh. Now, shove this handkerchief in your mouth and say goodbye to you. There. Where's Edgar? Never mind about him. Step over here. I won't. Where's Edgar? He's all right. Come here, baby. Get away from me. Listen, baby. Get don't away. get excited. Get I ain't going to hurt you. No. No. A week later, Ray Dirk, 200-pound truck driver, and a woman companion are parked in a lonely spot in San Fernando Valley, when suddenly... Get out of that car. Huh? Say, who are you? He's got a badge and a gun, Ray. Oh, a cop, huh? Well, that's different. Come on, May. Let's get up and see what he wants. There. Now, what's up? Put your hands up. What is this, a stick-up? Sure. Put up your hands and shut up. You too. Uh, now, put them up, May. We haven't got a chance. Keep your hands in the air while I see what you've got. There. There, let's see what you've got. May. Give him your purse, May. Don't worry. It's all right. Ray, he's not after my pocketbook. He's... Get away Shut from up, me. You. Well, you dirty... Stay there for I'll shoot. Yeah? Oh. I've got the gut. Take this. Oh, no, no, no. Right, right. I'll Just four days later, William Jacobson and his fiancée are parked on Foothill Boulevard near Pasadena, talking over their approaching marriage when the vicious badge bandit orders them out of their car. As the couple step out, the bandit suddenly grabs the girl. Jacobson, beyond himself with rage, rushes forward when... Ah! Don't kill him! Don't kill him! Shut up, you! Within two short weeks, the name of the badge bandit has become a symbol of terror to every motorist in Southern California. Outraged citizens appeal to the police to bring the vicious marauder and killer to justice. Day after day passes, each one bringing with it reports of suspicious characters from nervous citizens. But the cold-blooded murderer evades all attempts at capture. As a last resource, the late Sheriff Bill Trager presents a scheme to his men. Boys, we've tried all the regular ways and means of finding out who this bird might be. And so far, we know as much as we did when we started. Now, I'll grant that this is a tough case to crack. We can't use the stool pigeon method because it's obvious that this man is a lone wolf. But there is one thing we haven't tried, and I want you men to take a crack at it. What's that, Charlie? Well, it's going to sound mighty silly to you boys, but it might work. I want about ten of you to dress up as women. What? Wait a minute till I finish. 
I want you to team up in pairs. One of you dressed in women's clothes and one in plain clothes. And I want you to go up and park in all the spots off the regular roads. In the canyons, up on Mulholland Drive, everywhere this fellow might strike. It might work at that. Yeah, it might. But I'm going to feel mighty silly sitting around on a hill dressed like a woman and trying to look as if I enjoyed it. Well, how about it, boys? Will you have a go at it? Okay, sure. Good. Good. Now get this. Take your rifles and be careful. You've all heard how this man works. If you run into him, bring him in. If you can't bring him in alive, then bring him in dead. But get him one way or the other. Sheriff Traeger's men carry his plan out, but it proves to be futile. By some uncanny intuition, the phantom prowler seems to avoid them, but continues to rob and assault more victims every week. Suddenly, reports of robberies by the badge bandits stop pouring into the sheriff's office. A week goes by, two weeks, a month. The phantom killer has disappeared. Gradually, the feeling of apprehension dies as the weeks go by with no more robbery. The papers no longer carry headlines in black type telling of the phantom's latest atrocity. And then, as suddenly as he disappeared, the badge bandit returns. Newsboys hoarsely scream headlines. The phantom killer has returned. The hunt is on again. Relaxed nerves suddenly tighten. Young lovers hasten home from the movies. Mothers keep their daughters in at night. And then one day in the office of Sheriff Traeger. Yes? There's a lady here to see you, sir. She has no appointment, but it's very important. Very well. I'll ask you to come in. Yes, sir. How do you do? Come in, please. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Oh, Mr. Traeger, I need your help. My life has been threatened. Oh, I see. Well, if you'll tell me the fact. Mr. Traeger, my husband is a very jealous man. I'm afraid of him. Is it your husband that has made this threat? Yes. What is your husband's name? Harry Dunlap. I'm, I'm Mrs. Maud Dunlap. Thank you, Mrs. Dunlap. I suppose you tell me your story. Well, well, to begin with, Harry's always been a frightfully jealous sort of person. But until this last thing happened, I didn't think it was very serious. Uh, a few weeks ago... Could you give me the exact dates, Mrs. Dunlap? Sometimes they're uh, very important. Why, well, I don't remember the exact date. It was on Tuesday, I believe. About three weeks ago. Thank you. Now go on. Well, Harry, that's my husband, you know. Harry came home about dinner time and he brought a man with him. Mm-hmm. He introduced me to him and we had dinner together at our house. I see. Go on. Well, Mr. Small, that was the man's name, he was a plumber. Hmm. Mr. Small was awfully nice, and we had a pleasant evening, and then he went home. And what happened then? Well, nothing happened then, but a few days later, I met Mr. Small at the corner, and we talked for a while. And when I got home, Harry was there, and he seemed mad about something. I asked him what was the matter. He turned on me and accused me of playing around with Mr. Small. Mm. He told me that if he ever caught me with him, he'd fix me so that I'd never have a chance to make a fool out of him again. I see. He he was awfully mad. What frightened me, I, I decided to come to you for help. I'm afraid of him, Mr. Traeger. Well, under the circumstances, Mrs. Dunlap, what do you think should be done? Well, I intended to go to Bakersfield and stay with some relatives. But I want one of your officers to go with me for protection. You feel that this is necessary, Mrs. Dunlap? Oh, yes. I see. Very well. I'll arrange for one of my men to be with you on the trip. The nervous Mrs. Dunlap is provided with a police escort, and Sheriff Traeger, seeing nothing more than another routine case, dismisses the matter from his mind. A week passes, and then Deputy Sheriff Frank Duar appears in the sheriff's office. Come in, Frank. Now, what's on your mind? I've got a letter here that came to me yesterday. Thought it might interest you. A letter? Well, what's it all about? Well, it starts out like this. Uh, say, Dewar, I'm handing you a hot tip which will be a feather in your hat. As you'd done a friend of mine a good turn up in the county jail. Mm. I was up in George Small's apartment on North Grand Avenue the other night and heard this, which is big. Well, then he goes on to accuse this guy Small of being a hijacker by night and a plumber by day. Well, what's it all leading up to? Well, he says he runs around with a married woman who helped him on his jobs. Says she's a cashier down the drugstore at 6th and Spring Street. Oh. Well, the letter goes on, finishes up like this. Uh, Some time ago, they both double-crossed a friend of mine on a split and they're getting ready to blow town, so you will have to work fast. If I ever get anything else, Frank, I will sure hand it to you. It signs sincerely your pal. 
Hmm. Well, what do you make of it? Well, I don't know just what to make of it. I tell you, Frank, you'd better run this down and see what you can find. It may lead to something. Then again, it may not. Deputy Sheriff DeWar and Deputy Frank Modi spend several days tracing and checking the various addresses. Finally, they discover the apartment of George Small on Grand Avenue. They take Small and a woman companion who refuses to give her name into custody. When they arrive at the sheriff's office, they are met with a surprise. Well, Bill, we got the plumber and the woman, but they both have denied anything. They had anything to do with the robbers. Hmm. The woman says her husband wrote that letter, and it's all a bunch of lies. Well, where are they? Right outside. Good. Bring them in. All right. Bring them in here, Modi. Okay. All right, you two, right in there. Here they are, Bill. Judge Small, and I don't know the lady's name. She wouldn't give it. Come on in. Yeah, that's a pretty lousy thing, Sheriff. It's just a Wait point. a minute. I think I've met the lady before. How do you do, Mrs. Dunlap? Oh, ho- hello, Sheriff Trader. I thought you were safely in Bakersfield. Well, I was in Bakersfield for a while, but I've been back in town for the last few days. Hmm. Have you heard anything more from your husband, Mrs. Dunlap? Well, nothing until his officer showed me this letter. It's in his handwriting. Uh, he's just trying to get us in trouble. Because he's sore about me. You're sure that this letter's from your husband? I'm positive. Say, what the devil is this all Never about? mind, Frank. I'll tell you all about it later. Now, Mrs. Dunlap, perhaps you'd better tell me something about your husband. What does he do for a living? I don't know. He never would tell me anything about his business. He never told me anything except when he was threatening me. He never gave you any hint as to how he made his money? No, but... Once or twice, I've wondered what he'd been up to. What do you mean by that, Mrs. Dunlap? Well, he used to come home late at night, and several times his hands were scratched. Mm. And when I asked him how he'd scratched them, he only snarled at me and told me to mind my own business. I see. Well, one time he came home early in the morning, and his hand was bleeding. It looked as though he'd been bitten. But he wouldn't tell me how it happened. Bill, I got hmm? an idea. Mrs. Dunlap, do you happen to have any pictures of your husband? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I have two or three of them. What are they? Well, they're over at the apartment we just left. Come on, Frank. I've got a hunch. Deputy Dewar, accompanied by the now bewildered Modi, rushes to the apartment and finds three pictures. Armed with these, the men return to headquarters and lay their suspicions before Sheriff Traeger. So you see, Bill, it's only a hunch, but it might be the answer to the whole thing. Have you sent for the witnesses? Yeah. They ought to be here any time. I hope you're right, Dewar. That would help a lot if we knew the identity of the man. I've been getting more and more complaints because of our apparent failure to get anywhere in the case. I'm getting tired of the continual riding from upstairs. Yes? I think the dentist is the sheriff. Ah, send him in. Yes, sir. Well, Frank, here's the first one. We'll know pretty soon. Mr. Dirk, I'm in. Uh, thanks. Well, have you got the dirty rat? I have some pictures here I'd like you to look at, Mr. Dirk. Yeah. Do you know any of these men? Yeah, no. Never saw him before. That one? No. Nor him. How about this? Sheriff. Yes? This guy. He's the fellow that held me up. Are you sure of that, Duck? Sure. How can I miss that face? You bet I'm sure. One after another, the victims of the badge bandit are shown the pictures, and each one of them identifies the subject as the man who held them up. Deputy Sheriff Dewar's hunch is right. The badge bandit is Harry Dunlap, the threatening husband. Mrs. Dunlap is as surprised as anyone when she is told that her husband is the fiend that the whole country is looking for. The Los Angeles Examiner offers a reward of $1,000 for the capture of Henry Dunlap. Traps are laid for him. Mrs. Dunlap offers herself as human bait by going to her home in Bakersfield, where officers hope Dunlap will try to see her. Down to Tijuana, up to San Francisco, officers seek the hunted man. Circulars with a full description and a picture of him are sent to every city, town, and hamlet. And police are notified to arrest on sight. And then, just one month later, a man enters a dry goods store in Detroit. After selecting a sweater and some other wearing apparel, the man offers a check when the girl clerk refuses it. Now listen, lady. This check's good, and I want my change. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't take this check. I don't know you, and I don't know the maker of it. I don't care whether you know me or not. This check's good. I'm sorry, sir. Now, listen, girlie. You'll take this check and like it. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am? 
Something for you? Well, I'd like one of these sweaters. What size, please? Oh, I think a 38 would be about right. 38? All right. Here you are. That'll be 398. Mm hmm. 398. Well, uh, there you are. 398 out of five. 399, four, and one makes five. Thank you. Come in again. Yes, I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now listen, sister. How about it? You gonna take this check? I'm very sorry, sir, but it's against the rules to take checks from people we don't know. But this check's good, I tell you. I tell you I'm sorry, sir. All right. He's a cash customer. Take care of him. Eh? Yeah. I'd like to see your dollar shirts, please. All right, so right this way. What size? Mm, size 14 and a half. 14 and a half? Would you like a plain color or something in a check? Oh, plain colors, I think. Yes, sir. Now, here's a check shirt and one in plain color that's been very popular this season. Which mm. one do you like? Yeah, I think I'll pick one of each of those. All right. That's two dollars even. Yeah, two dollars. Yeah. yeah, here you are. Thank you. Oh. What's the matter? That man out there with the door. He's been trying to get me to cash a $20 check for him, and he won't leave. I thought he'd gone. But when I see him standing right out in front again... Yeah? You know the fella? No. Gee, I wish I knew what to do. Uh, you just sit tight, and I'll go to the corner and get a policeman. That's the best thing to do. Maybe you're right. Gee, I'd sure hate to get robbed. If he comes in when I leave, stall him till I get back with the officer. It'll only be half a minute. All right. And thanks, yeah, mister. It's all right. Well, sister, how about it? You're going to cash this check for me, aren't you? Getting tired of waiting while you talk to customers. Uh, well, listen, mister. Let me see that check again. There it is. You see, I, I might be able to cash it. The only reason that I haven't done it is because... The boss would fire me if he thought I cashed anyone's check whom I didn't know. Yeah, here and... it is, officer. What's the trouble here, miss? This man is trying to force me to cash a check for him, and he won't leave me alone. Uh, well, mister, what's the big idea? What do you mean, what's the big idea? Hey, come back here. Don't try to walk out on Lay me. Lay off me, you big flat foot. Now, just quiet down and stop your struggling. I'll let you have one. Uh, that's better. Uh, what's this all about? I'm just going to buy a necktie here. Then what did you try to run out for? You want me to call the station? No, I'll just walk him up to the corner and call for the wagon, but... Uh... First, I think I'll have a look at what he's got in his pocket. Yeah, yeah. Keep your hands off me. You. Now, stand still. Do you want me to use this for sweater on you? Let's see. Uh-huh. Nice little gun. Yeah. What's this? Dagger. Say, you must have been out for no good. Now, what's this in your upper pocket? Huh. Well, a deputy sheriff's badge. Come on, you. We're going to headquarters. <laughs> At headquarters, the suspect is fingerprinted and questioned. He denies any attempt to force the store girl to cash his check and claims that he only carries the gun and dagger for protection. Then suddenly, during the questioning, the arresting officer shoots a surprise question at him. How long has it been since you left Los Angeles? Los Angeles? I've never been in Los Angeles. You're lying. You're Harry Dunlap. You're crazy. My name's Fred Gunner. Your name's Harry Dunlap and you want it for murder. Now listen, tell you, I haven't done anything. Where'd you get that badge? I, I bought it. Where? At a pawn shop. Los Angeles? Yes. No, I mean Detroit. All right, Dunlap, tell us all about it. Uh, I admit my name is Harry Dunlap. I'm not the guy you're looking for. No? Well, take a look at that picture there on this police circular. Now, what do you think? Nothing. You have nothing to say about him, huh? No. Okay, Dunlap, I guess we'll have to take a ride out to Los Angeles. There's a couple of nice rewards waiting for you out there. <laughs> Harry Dunlap is returned to Los Angeles and identified by victims as the badge bandit. One by one, the witnesses face him, and each time their reply is the same. He is the man. Then the last witness is brought in. Ray Dirk stands face to face with Harry Dunlap. Mr. Dirk, is this the man? I guess that ought to answer that question. I've waited a long time for that pleasure. It is some time before the police manage to bring Dunlap back to consciousness. So terrific is the blow given him by Dirk. Days go by and the final preparations for the trial of the badge bandit are finished. The day of the trial finds the courtroom packed with grim-faced citizens, eager to be in at the kill. The first witness is called. Edgar Milburn, take a stand, please. It's only swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Now, my name is Edgar Milburn. Yes. On the night of the 15th of April, 1923, were you and a girl companion parked on Mulholland Drive? That's right. Isn't it a fact that on that night you were robbed and assaulted by a man who carried a badge? It is. Is that man in the court today? 
He is. Will you walk to that man and lay your hand upon his arm? This is the man. Thank you, Mr. Milburn. That's all. Next witness. Ray Dirt. Please take the same. I only swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys. I do. Your name is Ray Dirk? It is. Mr. Dirk, the night of the 23rd of April, 1923, you were robbed and beaten by a man who carried a badge. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Could you identify that man if you saw him again? I'll say I could. Is that man in this court? Yes. Will you please point him out to me? That's the rat over there. Thank you, Mr. Duck. That's all for the present. Oh, no, it isn't. I'm going to smack that ugly face for his once more. Oh, now, look out here. Now, wait a minute. Please, please. Order. Order in the court. Please. Return to your seat. I can sympathize with your desire, but this is the courtroom. All right. Well, I'm going to get him sometime and give him what he deserves. The trial goes on for weeks, and piece by piece, the evidence is piled up until at last the case is completed. In the courtroom, deep silence as the jury file in with their decision. Foreman of the jury, have you reached a decision? We have, Your Honor. Read it aloud to the court. We, the jury... Find Harry Dunlap guilty of the charges of robbery, assault, and murder. <laughs> Harry Dunlap, stand and face the court. Before this court passes sentence on you, have you anything to say? Nothing. Harry Dunlap, it is unfortunately not within my power to impose upon you the death sentence. But fortunately, I can be sure that you will never again endanger the peace and security of your fellow men. Harry Dunlap, I hereby sentence you to Folsom Penitentiary for the terms prescribed by the law for the crimes of robbery, criminal assault, and assault with intent to kill. Such terms to be served consecutively. crimes for which Dunlop was sentenced carried a maximum sentence of 150 years. It should be a source of great satisfaction to the citizens of your community that the minimum sentence Dunlop must serve before he is even eligible for parole is 60 years, and it seems unlikely that he will live long enough to make his release possible. Under a sterner, and perhaps in the final analysis, a more just code, Dunlop should have been given the death penalty, a reward I heartily recommend to all such public menaces as he was. Thank you, Chief Davis. And now, because every good detective story ends with a confession, we call upon the criminal of tonight's program, played by Stuart Buchanan, who has a personal confession to make to you. Well, I must confess this, because there are many persons listening tonight who are making the same mistake I made. And I want to convince you of the error of your ways. I've been buying the cheapest gasoline I could get. It didn't make any difference what brand. All that interested me was price. I drive rather an old car, and I figured any gas was good enough. By working on these programs, it induced me to spend a few cents more and try Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And I'm here to tell you that Rio Grande is not exaggerating one bit when they tell you what a difference crack makes in your car. I feel the difference, especially these cold mornings, when my old motor starts immediately. You know, instead of wearing out the battery like it used to. And for years, I've been taking certain hills in second gear. No fool and I actually make those hills in high now. Real Grande cracked gasoline is responsible. I've been playing a part tonight to convince you that crime doesn't pay. Now let me tell you that it doesn't pay to use cheap gasoline. It costs you no more to get police car performance. Calling all cars is...